Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our meeting. I would like to call to order the Academic and Student Success Committee of the University of Houston Board of Regents. Uh, before we get started on our agenda today, I would like to acknowledge uh, someone in our, off in our audience. Uh, Mr. Asit Shaw, is he here? Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll come back and uh, acknowledge him uh, shortly thereafter. He is our new student regent. Uh, we do have a packed agenda today. Uh, we have 12 approval items to be presented today for committee's consideration and one information item. Uh, following the presentation of the items, I will ask the committee if there are any questions and then call for the vote. And once all action items have been presented and approved, if appropriate, I will make a motion that we have these items placed on the board's consent docket agenda for final board approval at the Board of Regents meeting scheduled for Wednesday, May 7th, 2014. Our first item listed on the agenda today for committee's consideration is item B, the approval of appointment of Dean University of Houston Law Center, University of Houston, Dr. Uh, Paula Short, Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Provost. Will you please introduce this item? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Regent Wilson. I am delighted to bring before the board for your approval the appointment of Leonard Baines, Professor of Law and the inaugural director of the Ronald H. Mm -hmm. Brown Center for Civil Rights and Economic Development at St. John's University School of Law. Mr. Baines earned his JD degree from Columbia Law School in 1982. He earned an MBA from Columbia in 1983 and his BS in Finance and Economics from New York University in 1979. At St. John's University, he teaches business organizations, communications law, perspectives on justice, race and law, and regulated industries. Prior to joining St. John's in 2002, he taught at Western New England University School of Law in Springfield, Massachusetts. He served part-time as a scholar in residence for the Federal Communications Commission from 1997 to 2001, and he worked as an associate with the corporate real estate and regulatory practice at Gaston and Snow in New York. He has also worked as in-house counsel for 9X in Boston, and after uh, law school, he clerked for the Honorable Clifford Scott Green of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh, we are delighted uh, that uh, Mr. Baines uh, rose to the top of our list of candidates for this position. I want to thank Donna Cornell for chairing the search committee, and I'm honored today to present Mr. Baines to you for approval for our new Dean of our Law Center at the University of Houston. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Short. Does anyone have any uh, questions? Uh, or would you like to? Uh, I would just like to you know, ask uh, what, what you see, uh, I guess basically, Looking at the law, the law school at University of Houston, what do you see in its future, and what do you think uh, you might be able to take the school from this point forward? Uh, my goal is to make sure that the University of Houston Law Center is the best law school that it can be. It's a very strong law school now. It's important for it to increase its rankings and its programs. Um, we face challenges, uh, as many law schools do, with the decline of applications and LSAT test takers. But my goal is to be flexible, uh, to be innovative, and to make sure that we um, are able to meet those challenges. And I'm excited to be here. I'm wearing my red. Yeah. Maybe the wrong color red, I realize. But the only red I had in my closet. But I have to add to my red. So you're, you're I'm, proud to be, uh, red I'm proud to be a cougar. 
Anytime you anytime you're short on red, go see the, uh, the chancellor, and she will. Uh, she has a back stock. Uh, okay. Well, uh, just out of curiosity, what it, nationally, what what's, what do you think is driving the reduction in, in law center applicants? Um, I think part of it is the, really the critique of the legal profession and law schools generally, and the economy. The, the good thing that Houston and Texas has is a very strong economy. In fact, a lot of law schools are sending their students here to interview, so there's a competition. But nationwide, there's been a real decline in the number of jobs for law school students. So that's what's partially driving it. And there's been a lot of critiques of the profession, the legal profession, and law schools generally with respect to the fact that there have been some law schools that have um, engaged in some gamesmanship or gamespersonship of U.S. news with respect to the career placement numbers, with respect to the scholarships they award, and all those sorts of things. And all of that has led to this, um, a lot of conversation in the, over the internet and the blogosphere about not going to law school. Okay. And I think all of that's what's causing this drive in the reduction of applications and LSAT test takers. Thank you. Any uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, first, welcome, Leonard uh, Baines, to, to the University of Houston. Um, I understand that, uh, well, let me thank uh, Ms. Cornell for a very ex extensive search. I've heard that uh, it was very exhaustive. Um, a, a number of internal constituencies as well as external constituencies um, met over a great period of time, so I know you've been evaluated inside and out uh, and have um, met the standards. So thank you for applying. Thank you for your interest. And we look forward to working with you uh, as a dean of our law school. Great. Any other uh, questions or comments? Anyone? Uh, if, if not, I'll, uh, uh, may I entertain a motion to approve this item as presented, please? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? A uh, motion uh, for the appointment of Leonard Baines as Dean of University of Houston Law Center, University of Houston, effective August 15, 2014, has been approved by the committee. Uh, congratulations. And, and Thank you, and I really appreciate it. I really appreciate this honor, and I won't let you down. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have item C, approval of facility promotion in academic rank, University of Houston system. Dr. Short, uh, will you please introduce this item? Thank you so much. As uh, we have described to you in the past, uh, we have a, vigor a very rigorous re review process for considering promotion uh, to full professor and for promotion and tenure. For our faculty, it, it's a year-long process that begins early in a person's career with annual reviews, a third-year mandatory review by the department and the college, and then in the sixth year, the candidate then proceeds to put their materials together to be considered for promotion and tenure at the university. Um, the, ch the candidate works with the department chair. There's a review at the department <coughs> level, a review at the chair level, a review at the college level, a review by the college dean. All along the way, there are required external letters evaluating the candidate's uh, productivity and research teaching and service. These are external arm's length letters written by folks who have not collaborated with the faculty nor have published with them. All of this is pulled together and reviewed up through the university P&T committee, finally to the provost and the provost makes recommendations to the president. So before you today, you have the names of individuals from all four of our system campuses who have been through this rigorous process, and they are recommended today for your approval uh, for promotion and tenure, and some of the candidates for promotion to full professor. So uh, it's obviously a very extensive list. The, uh, uh, so each one of these had been, uh, it starts at, I guess, the department level right. and then it has to work its way all the way uh, uh, up through the system. They're evaluated at each of those levels. They're offered the opportunity to present additional information to the committee all along the way in that process. So they're reviewed extensively from the department level 
the college level, the university level, the provost level, and to the president. Yes. Gotcha. One more thing which is important, that is the, it's an external review, and it is review uh, by the candidates, uh, the people in the candidates' field. Anybody who has not known or collaborated <coughs> or studied with the candidate, and many times these are blind reviews. In other words, a list is prepared from the institutions that are higher than our status, and the question we ask those reviewers is that w would this person, um, you, I mean, what's your assessment of the review and would this person be tenurable or promotable at your institution? And that's the information, those are called the, the reviewers' letters. Those are the letters that are part of the dossier when it is starts its review process in, within the department. So I think the first thing is external nationwide uh, assessment and, and um, uh, I guess, review of what this person has done in terms of research and teaching and service. So is that at each level from assistant professor to associate professor to a full professor yes. or is that no, the I external just a part of going from associate okay. professor to full professor? We do it at every level. Okay. So if somebody is going from associate to full professor, it's still they have to put their entire portfolio together and that that portfolio is sent out to reviewers who do not know this candidate may not have any, um, should never have had any work or study related experience. Okay, then what about from assistant professor to associate yes. professor? Same, same, same process? Yes. Absolutely the same process. There's a lot more rigor at that time. Rigor in the sense the dossiers look a lot bigger because it's a tenure. And so if mm -hmm. we are tenuring somebody, we are committing for 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, at least with that person, maybe 40, right. 50 years. So, I think, to me, that part is really critical because we reach out to people who are at very high institutions, and uh, sometimes they are second or third, you know, the, the way, so the candidate would not know these people at all. We make sure the candidate does not know, and then, um, then they tell us what they think of the candidate's work, and that becomes part. And then there is a departmental committee that meets, the committee of tenure and tenure earning, I mean, tenure professors, then from there it will go to the department chair for chair's evaluation, then it goes to the college committee, then the dean, then the university committee, then the provost, and then it comes to me, and after that it comes to you. So it's a, what we call it a seven-layer review before anybody comes here. That's, uh, that's impressive. Huh? It's it is. That's a process. Yeah. It's a very stressful process. Mm -hmm. I can vouch for it. A couple Wait. other questions, if I might, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm assuming that the reason the professors aren't listed as tenured is that they're already tenured from being associate professors? Correct. Okay. <coughs> okay. And the other question is, I'm also the external evaluations relate to the scholarship of the professor, their writings, the things that people outside of the institution can, can read or know about uh, that establishes their their reputation and credibility in that particular field? Yes. Is that the purpose that's of that? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Right. No other questions, Chairman. Any other questions? Anyone? If not, may I hear a motion to approve this item? Oh, we have one, one amendment, one change. These are not correct. So the names or their rank? They were ranks. not promoted. They were not promoted incorrectly. So we need to remove those names? So the list, if I might, Mr. Chairman, will be amended uh, to remove Linda Bressler from Business and Ryan Pepper, Ryan Pepper from Sciences and Technology <coughs> at UHD. Great. So may I hear a motion to approve uh, the item uh, presented with that modification, please? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, the item is hereby approved. Uh, next item for approval is item D, the approval of faculty emeritus appointments, University of Houston system. Dr. Short, would you please present this item? Thank you. Uh, we are asking board approval uh, for the faculty that are before you uh, with their bios for appointment as faculty emeriti uh, at the University of Houston at, and at the University of Houston downtown. Uh, emeriti or emeritus title is conferred upon a retired, tenured faculty member who has made very significant contributions 
to the university, usually through a very long and distinguished career uh, in scholarship, teaching, and service at the university. We do expect faculty who are granted emeritus um, status to remain active uh, with the university when they're requested to serve or requested to contribute, they're willing to do so, particularly in their area, area of competence. Uh, before you today, you have 17 faculty from the University of Houston who've been nominated by their colleges and their deans for this uh, status on six nominations from the University of Houston downtown. Uh, their bios are included and we're requesting your approval for these faculty. So, uh, so they're currently uh, employed by the university and being asked to be emeritus, or they're about to retire, or they're, what's the? About, about to retire, they are retiring, Most, yes. Some of them have already retired, and right. some of them are about to retire. So this is just an honorary designation, but we do ask that they uh, stay involved with the program of the school. That's right. that. That's correct, yeah. And given this, it's recommended by the head of their department. Is that where it starts? And then yes. Or, Mr. Chairman, yes. Are, there, are there any benefits that go along with this designation that would cost the University of Houston? No. No? no. Okay. There. So there are no ongoing mutual obligations between the professor or the university? There's no there are no financial commitments that the university maintains with okay. faculty that are on emeritus status. There's, you know, a, from time to time faculty will come and they may um, continue to do research in certain circumstances. Um, but it, there's no ongoing commitment on the university's part. Could they teach a class if they so wanted and there was a need for that? Okay. Yes. Any other questions? If not, I hear a motion to approve this item as presented, please. So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, this item is hereby approved. Next item, item E, the request for approval to increase the University of Houston downtown's transfer admission standards to a 2.0 transfer GPA, University of Houston downtown, is our next action item for consideration by Dr. Short. Thank you. UH downtown would like to establish this automatic transfer admission standard of a minimum of a 2.0 transfer GPA. Students who um, transfer with less than 15 credit hours will continue to meet their freshman admission standards. And the rationale behind this is the fact that many of the community college partners of UHD have expressed concern with their current transfer policy, which allows students who perhaps are on suspension or even probation from our community colleges to enroll at UHD. And one of the things that they've discovered, obviously, is that students who transfer with lower than a 2.0 have a retention rate and a six-year graduation rate that is significantly lower than students who enter with a transfer GPA of 2.0 or higher. And with UHD's efforts to improve uh, the success of their students, their graduation, six-year graduation rates, their retention rates, they believe that the move to a 2.0 uh, transfer admission requirement will greatly increase the success of students who enter that institution. I've asked uh, Dr. Flores to speak to the impact of uh, this admission standards um, in terms of diversity and the impact in terms of financial um, repercussions. And so if you would, wouldn't mind, come forward and also answer any questions that the committee might have about changing this policy. Thank you. As you know, um, University implemented admission status for freshmen uh, this past fall and has already had tremendous success in uh, increasing our retention rate. Uh, for the, at the end of the first semester, we had a retention rate of 91 percent for the for the cohort that was brought in, in uh, this fall. Um, that was through a lot of different strategies that we used for freshman retention, including early intervention. We've done the same thing with transfer students. In preparation for implementation of admission standards, 
we've been working with the community colleges, building partnerships, uh, reinforcing existing uh, reverse transfer agreements and joint admissions agreements. The reverse transfer agreements are particularly important because since the community colleges are the first ones basically going to a uh, performance-based funding as a percentage of their fundings, that one of the things that they're going to get um, what have been called in, in under one model, um, it's a, a certain amount of points that they, they, they get, uh, is based on the number of students that get Associate of Arts degrees. Well, when we signed the agreements with them for uh, our Gator Guarantee, we, we signed an agreement that, that students will transfer to us after 24 hours and after they've completed um, all of their developmental and the 24 hours of credit with a 2.0 or higher. We're already starting to receive some of those students. What you see is, um, if you look at, at the chart, first of all, all of our peers in the, uh, in the Texas area have 2.0 2 or actually in the case of Clear Lake, 2.25 uh, as, as entry requirements for those coming with 30 or uh, to 44 hours or more. Um, what we have seen is a growth in the number of students that have 2.0 or higher already. And if you look at the next chart, um, we have, for example, the total number of students that had 2.0 or higher in fall 2011 was 1,484. Um, for fall 2013, it's 1850. If you look at the ethnicities increases, uh, each group has grown in terms of percentage of 2.0 or, or higher. So, for example, African Americans, uh, the, uh, initially we only had uh, 381 African Americans um, at a 2.0 or higher, which wasn't too far off from the number of white students that we had at 440. You go to 2013 and we're 527. Now, the <coughs> differential impact of 2.0, a lot of the students that have been coming in with less than 2.0 are minority students. They've been students, uh, Hispanic and African American students. So we've been working with the community colleges, particularly Central. Central is where we get most of our transfers, uh, Central at HCC. It's also where we get most of our African American transfers. And we've been working with them to increase the preparation of those students. We're going to be uh, co placing some advisors. Our intent is to do two things. One, to increase the total number of students who come with a 2.0 or higher. And we think that that will help us recoup any lost funds. And the other is increase the number of students who come prepared so that we can retain them, similar to the kinds of success we've had with freshmen. We do both of those, and we, we see uh, we're projecting a very minimal impact either on ethnicity or on, uh, on uh, funding. If, if we do not do this, we, we would see a shortfall of about 500,000, but we are, we're looking at increasing uh, total enrollment uh, sufficient to pick that back up and retain, the, by increased retention, the remainder of it. So the, um, uh, so we're already doing it for incoming freshmen, and you already have policies yes. and procedures in place to uh, adopt those new freshmen and kind of help them get through the rough patch. So all we're doing is really just applying the same methodology to the transfer students and and be consistent with what every other you know four-year institution in Texas is doing. Well, I, I would I would say that it's probably long overdue that we establish these. Uh, minimum standards when, you know, back in the day there were not, we didn't have the strong community college system in the Houston area that we do today. And so I think the, the, the market is, is served uh, for all students at whatever level between the combination of the community college system and the various U of H uh, system campuses. So, you know, I think we need to, uh, I uh, personally concur that we know this is good to raise this bar and set it and, uh, and I'm glad to hear that uh, you feel like it'll be uh, nominal impact on the on the status quo. 
And one of the things I mentioned with the relationship with the community college, under the incentive funding, they get momentum points for the number of students who actually graduate with an Associate of Arts degree. So we have been working with HCC, San Jacinto, and Lone Star to increase the number of students who are, are getting that, earning their sphere, and completing the number of degrees, uh, the number of, of credits sufficient for them to get the Associate of Arts degree. Sending that back to the, the community college, and then they get credit. Those students receive their Associate of Arts degree, and we're seeing higher graduation rate, rates for this, those students who actually go through the reverse transfer program and earn their degree. So both of our institutions are benefiting. Any, uh, any questions? I've got a couple, a couple uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's interesting to see, just looking at your chart on page 28, mm -hmm. just looking at the African American and Hispanic numbers, uh, since fall of 2011, the actual numbers of African American and Hispanic students with a 2.0 or greater looks like has actually in, in, in increased. I think you mentioned that. Uh, what do you attribute that to? Is that the uh, community college is doing a better job of, uh, of the quality of their students? Is that is outcomes-based funding impacting some of that? What do you attribute that to? Well, I think it's the partnerships that we've worked with the community colleges because what we're trying to do is do joint admissions on the front end, moving the students that are not prepared back to the community college, having them address the deficiencies, okay. and, get, and make sure the students get 24 hours under their belt with a 2.0 or, or higher. Then they transfer back to us and we have a scholarship depending upon what their, their uh, GPA is. That's helping, and you're seeing that, that in, the, in the numbers. Okay. Uh, I know it's not the topic of, of today's discussion, but at some point I think it might be good for the Academics Committee to see uh, the impact on enrollment of our, in, our increased admission standards for the fall of this, this past fall. I don't know if we've seen that before. Uh, how was it impacted? Did it was there a significant impact either way? Even in terms of in terms of the enrollment, groups? right? Well, uh, it, it, first in general. Well, the yeah, yeah, the incoming freshmen. Well, as we for, for the freshmen, well, uh, um, we consciously reduced the size of the freshman class okay. uh, last fall. Uh, th th this for this fall, and we hit that target. Okay. of what we reduced it to. Now we're going to grow it for next year. Uh, but we're growing it with the new admission standards. So uh, we did have a slight decrease in the number of freshmen, but as I said, as I said that was planned. Uh, we would have liked to have seen more transfer students than we got. We did get more continuing students returning. Um, this year for the summer, we're to, uh, year to date, we're up 6% as to where we were last year. And for the fall, year to date, um, if you compare the number of applicants and those students who are already admitted for the fall versus this point last year, we're up 16%, meaning the new standards. Now, I can't guarantee that we'll, that we'll be up 16% when it comes down to the, to the census. Well, that's great. I mean, that's really good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that I have to thank our team for, for doing that. Uh, Ed and Tamiki and, and the people that work in enrollment management, they're out there every day. Any other uh, questions for Dr. Flores or Dr. Short? If not, thank you, Dr. Flores. Uh, may I hear a motion to approve this item as presented, please? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, this item is approved. Uh, next eight items. Uh, the next eight action items listed on your agenda that the committee will consider uh, deal with the approval and recommendation of various degree programs at the University of Houston. Uh, the first two for the committee's consideration are items F and G, uh, request for approval of a Bachelor of Arts in Religious Studies at the University of Houston and approval of a Master of Public Policy at the University of Houston. Dr. Short, uh, will you please present this item? Thank you, Regent Wilson. Uh, as uh, Regent Wilson mentioned, we have two degrees from the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. Uh, the first degree for your approval today is a Bachelor of Arts 
in religious studies. It's a 36 credit hour major uh, designed to prepare students for employment in global and multicultural workplaces. Uh, beyond the traditional job market, which includes churches, social service, schools, counseling facilities, government agencies and international businesses are now seeking employees who have an academic training in religious studies to work in conflict management and resolution worldwide, uh, particularly with the diversity of religions that we see and that we meet in the workplace now. Uh, U of H has had a long history with a minor in religious studies. It's a well-enrolled set of courses, uh, and there have been a strong number of students graduating over the years with a minor in religious studies. In the program's first five years, they anticipate 210 students to enroll. 30 students are expected to enroll uh, this first year of the program upon your approval. And the financials also show that it will generate revenue in its first year with a cumulative gain of 293000 in the first five years of the program. Uh, it is a very popular, as I said, minor. There are 73 declared religious study, studies minors right now in the program, and they usually average around 54 uh, and have over the history of the minor. So um, this has been, again, through a thorough review. It's reviewed at the college level. It's reviewed through our faculty senate committees that look at all new programs. It's been reviewed by the system provost council, which is the council of all of the provosts from the four universities, and we bring it to you today for your approval. All right, I think we're, um, we take these individually or just, or? Want me to? Great, any questions uh, regarding the religious studies? Yeah, I just have one. I'm, I'm looking at the pro, pro, pro forma, and I guess we estimate this to be a program that will support itself. Yes, it will. Yes. Any other questions? If not, I hear a motion to approve this item as presented. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, this, uh, this item is carried. Uh, next item is the Master of Public Policy at the University of Houston. Dr. Short. Thank you. <coughs> the proposed Master of Public Policy is a 37 credit hour um, degree. It will have an internship or a thesis. Uh, we have the Hobby Center uh, for Public Policy, as you know, that is an advocacy center, a service center. Uh, adding a degree, um, the master's degree in public policy, will allow uh, the college and the center to begin to train students who have the research skills. Uh, it is a research degree that they will have the research skills to conduct rigorous policy analysis and shape policy, public policy, and um, uh, programs at both the local, state, national, and international levels. Uh, we believe that it's a very significant program to add to the um, policy center in the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. Um, there are no Masters of Public Policy degrees within a 100-mile radius of Houston. Uh, we believe that it doesn't duplicate um, any other program that might exist. We are expecting uh, 15 students to enroll in the first year with approximately 56 students by the fifth year. And we also expect this program to generate revenue in its first year uh, with a profit of over a million in the first five years of its existence. It will require the hiring of a program director who would manage the program, teach several courses. But one of the beauties of this program is the fact that it's very interdisciplinary. So faculty from across multiple disciplines, economics, uh, uh, um, history, uh, political science, uh, a number of areas will be faculty who can contribute to this program. And we believe that it uh, will certainly uh, position us with the Hobby uh, School of Public Policy upon its establishment to be a significant program in that uh, school. So we recommend approval 
I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the program. And the, uh, and the difference in credit hours between a master and a, and a uh, MBA is what, how does it differ as far as the number of hours required for a master? And an MBA, MBA is 48. And a master's? In public policy, 37. 37? Yeah. Right. So this master's case. degrees run anywhere from 30 to 36, 37 hours right. typically. This one is 37. Any other questions? Uh, will we uh, offer this program as a dual degree for our law and business students, or will you have to apply directly, um, or can you only take this program by itself? Well, currently, it's once it's established, those kinds of things can be can certainly follow uh, once the degree is established. That's a normal uh, progression for student to meet the student needs but currently we're that's not on the uh, that's not part of this proposal but I would see that coming a uh, Regent Wells definitely there's a real close relationship with, so that students can get that dual degree in those areas it's a natural yeah that's a great question just to follow up and I would strongly encourage us to move toward uh, creating joint opportunities between the Master of Public Policy and some of our other 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 colleges. Um, were you finished, Regent Wells? Yes. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, since the creation of the Hobby School, have we reorganized the College of Liberal Arts with respect to how we're going to offer courses within the Hobby School? Um, I mean, I'm assuming this this Master of Public Policy will be be in the hobby school. Do we have undergraduate programs that are there right now or is this the first program we've created under the under the hobby school? So this, this is right now um, is a center and we are in, in the process of raising funds that are necessary for okay. us to be able to establish and Governor Hobby of course is the biggest champion and is helping sure. us and this degree program is simply in preparation rather than waiting till the funds are raised to create a separate school. We just thought it's better to, um, at least for students, to make this available. But we hope that within two years we should be able to okay. raise the funds that are necessary to pre-establish one. And I guess once we raise those dollars to pay all the expenses associated with, you know, really beginning a school of public policy, then at that point, Will the undergraduate courses also, once we have the funds? I think the vision is to have this only as a graduate. Only as a graduate, okay. Yeah. okay. That is the vision of this one. So there may be other, down the road as we raise more funds, there may, there may be other graduate programs possibly. Okay. Any other questions? I've made a note of the dual degree suggestion. I think that's an excellent one. Thank you both. I'm sure the college will be very open to that. That's great. Uh, may I hear a motion to approve this item uh, for the approval of Master of Public Policy at the University of Houston, please? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, this item is approved. Uh, the next four degree programs for the committee's consideration today are approvals for various master degree programs at the Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston uh, as follows. Uh, approval of a Master of Science in Marketing at the University of Houston, approval of a Master of Science in Management Information Systems at the, at the University of Houston, approval of a Master of Science in Supply Chain Management at the University of Houston, and approval of a Master of Science in Global Energy Management at the University of Houston. Uh, following, uh, following the presentation of these four items, I'll call for the vote. Uh, Dr. Short, will you please introduce these items? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I also have the Dean of the Bauer College of Business, uh, Dean Ron Sean, who's available. Uh, should you have very specific questions about uh, the College of Business's uh, rationale for these, but I'd like to set a context uh, and say that in recent years there's been a trend away from the conventional MBA degree and more towards specialized uh, Master of Science programs. Uh, in business. Uh, the MBA, as you asked earlier, is a 48 credit hour degree. Uh, it uh, requires 
uh, two and a half to three years to complete, whereas these set of four master's degrees are 36 hours and can be completed in less than two years. So many people in the workplace uh, are looking for opportunities to be very marketable in the business area, but to do so um, without the investment of time and cost uh, that the MBA requires. And less and less are businesses requiring the MBA, but looking for more specialized skills that these four master's degrees uh, that the Bauer College of Business is proposing would be able uh, to meet. I will uh, mention a few points about each one um, and then would be happy to answer any questions that you might have, uh, as well as Dean Ramshan would be pleased to do so. Uh, the first degree is a Master of Science uh, in Marketing. Uh, this degree uh, is proposed to help students uh, who want to advance their careers, again, by having marketing skills uh, to use in the workplace and to have that advanced credential uh, in the field of marketing and sales. Um, one of the things that we have noticed is that the Graduate Management Admissions Council in a market a trend report recently uh, indicated that 78% of MS programs in marketing and communications are seeing a huge increase in demand for those programs and for people that are prepared in that field. We expect enrollment uh, to reach 50 students by the fourth year. We also expect this program, as with others I've presented to you, uh, to be self-sustaining within its first year. We expect it to be a very popular program uh, and um, present it to you uh, for your approval today. The uh, next degree is the MS uh, in Management Information Systems. Again, this is a 36 credit hour uh, master science degree. Uh, it will allow information technology professionals to upgrade their skills in the ever-changing computer market, as you are aware. But it focuses on the managerial aspect of information technology, uh, which is very much in demand. And it allows technologists who already have an undergraduate degree in this area to expand the scope of their skills. Again, it's a high demand uh, program. Uh, careers in this field have uh, grown uh, dramatically. Um, the, um, there are a number of MS, um, MS, MIS programs in Texas, uh, but um, those that are closest to us, UH Downtown has an MS program in security and our UH College of Technologies program, the MS program, uh, is in project management and security. This program is projected to reach 60 students by its fifth year and again be a, a, a program that is self-sustaining in its first year of operation. This uh, program uh, will also accommodate students who want to attend part-time also those who are already in professional IT positions in the workplace. The next of the four programs is the MS in Global Energy Management. Did I skip over one? Yep, uh, supply chain. Okay. Supply chain management. Let me go back to supply chain management. I flipped a little, a little too far. Um, again, this MS program is one of the fastest growing business disciplines in the Bauer College of Business. Um, it, again, will allow professionals in supply chain management to advance their careers, uh, providing them the advanced credential that they need. This, again, will be a, a, a program that accommodates both full-time and part-time students. Mm -hmm. Uh, over the past five years, the number of undergraduate students majoring in supply chain management in Bauer has grown from 50 to 595. So it's a, a growth area, one in which Bauer wants to tap into. Uh, and there is a nationwide shortage of supply chain management professionals who have the graduate training. And so the, the, one of the things that um, 
impacted the decision in Bauer to move forward with this degree was that members of their Supply Chain Management Center Advisory Board indicated that they often recruit outside of Texas to find people who have degrees in this area because there is an insufficient level of master's level supply chain management programs in Houston uh, and in the region. And the last program uh, put forth by Bauer today is the Global Energy Management Master's Program. Um, this industry is facing a shortage of managers who are knowledgeable about the business aspect of the, in of the industry. And it's designed uh, to impart both knowledge of the business of energy as well as exposure to management skills. Um, this proposed program will be attractive to workers in the energy uh, industry who want a graduate degree focused on effective management of the en energy industry uh, rather than, again, complete, completing the longer and more general MBA. The Bauer College has seen a high student demand for energy courses and energy certificates are the most popular certificates in the college's MBA program. They expect this particular program to reach 60 students by its fifth year. Uh, and currently there is no Master of Science in Global Energy Management in Texas um, to compete with the Bauer College. It will be a program that will also generate revenue its first year and should be a self-sustaining program uh, in its future. So I, we, these degrees have also been through a thorough review and we recommend your consideration for approval of these four master's degrees uh, in the Bauer College of Business. But uh, any, uh, <coughs> any questions for uh, Dr. Short or you see the dean is here? <clears throat> How are you? Thank you for coming this morning. The um, uh, the students, uh, where do these students come from? Are these coming from our current ranks, in your opinion, or are they? So there's, there's two audiences for these programs. One is, um, so currently we offer two masters uh, in science programs in accountancy and one in finance. The accountancy program has about 325 students. That tends to be bachelor's, students completing a bachelor's degree in accountancy and then going for a master. So it's almost like they do it automatically. The MS Finance is a different audience. We're looking at students that have been out there for maybe a couple of years after an undergraduate degree wanting to come back. And we see the four new proposals that we are introducing today as trying to leverage both markets. So for instance, the information systems degree is appealing to an undergraduate who wants to get another years of uh, coursework and get a master's. On the other hand, the global energy management uh, seems like it might be more viable and more attractive to someone who's been out there and wants to come back. So there's really two audiences that are being targeted through this. Great. Uh, question? Yes, thank you, Regent Wilson. I have uh, two questions. The first is for the dean. Um, will the marketing program impact, or how does that work with the current MBA program? Will an MBA student in the general MBA who takes marketing classes still be able to do that, or will they be encouraged to go directly into a master's of marketing? So again, the, uh, the MBA student tends to be, as you probably know, someone with five plus years of work experience. These master's programs are not necessarily in that domain. So if there is a student who's finished his undergrad that wants to come back after one year of working out there, that would be appealing to that group. This is not to say that our current MBAs cannot take these courses. In fact, what we're trying to do is to uh, leverage what we currently offer so we can offer these new master's programs with minimal additional cost so that you could have an MS student taking a marketing course in the same class as an MBA student wanting to take the same course. Sir. Thank you. And, and my second question is for Provost Short. Um, 
Can, can you explain, I'm just out of curiosity, how this program is different than the College of Technologies Master in Logistics? Will that program still be offered as well? Again, uh, you may want to address that. I think the dean could better address that because they have dealt with that as they plan the program. The, the requirements are quite different across these two programs. Again, the audiences are very different and the markets that they enter into, the recruiting market tends to be quite different. So we see these as really two different groups of people wanting to come back and get a degree. The supply chain and the information systems, for instance, tend to be our students wanting to come back to get a, a master's. The technology programs tends to tend to look at a different audience, just like HRM, uh, human resource management, tends to be offered to some extent by the business school as well as by the School of Technology. I don't think they compete necessarily. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to comment. Um, um, I applaud this uh, direction we're going in. I think there's a lot of really good reasons for doing this. One, I think it increases the pedigree of our university to offer these high quality master's degrees. Uh, and clearly there's a need in Houston for these courses because they're not offered, but also for our energy industry and uh, other opportunities here in Houston. Uh, plus, I think the additional um, certification gives uh, some incentive for folks who want to uh, set themselves apart in marketing, for example, to come back and get a master's. Um, so I think there's a great market for these courses. I think it increases um, the the university's pedigree and and I applaud you guys for working in this area and creating these new opportunities. Oh, sorry, we, uh, is that microphone working? Okay, it is. Okay. And we appreciate your hard work. Thank you so much. Couldn't have happened without the leadership here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, if you if somebody un undertakes a master's degree and now they're they're getting close to the uh, 36 hours and they decide to continue the experience uh, as an MBA, do they start? Is that can that just be extended, or is it, or do you start, or do you have to kind of go through a different line? You don't have to come back and restart, but you can only transfer up to 12 credits. So in other words. The MS is a 36 credit program, the MBA is 48. You can't transfer all 36 into the MBA. You still have to take another 36 credits to get an MBA. Gotcha, but, so. but if 12 hours in you decide to shift gears, then you, then you still have that option. Yes, absolutely. Got it, great. Uh, thank you. If there's no, no further questions, uh, I hear a motion to approve these four items as presented, please. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Uh, the four master degree programs proposed at the University of Houston is hereby <coughs> approved. Uh, the last two degree programs for the committee's consideration today is a Doctor of Philosophy in Geosensing Systems, Engineering, and Sciences at the University of Houston. And lastly, the approval of a Doctor of Philosophy in Petroleum Engineering at the University of Houston. Uh, Dr. Short, will you please introduce these items? Thank you. The Cullen College of Engineering is proposing a Ph.D. program to provide doctoral level education in geosensing systems, engineering, and sciences. Um, for those of you that wonder what geosensing is, uh, in the earth sciences community, they have uh, described it as using uh, remote sensing technologies uh, to, de to determine such things as uh, the location of subsurface seamounts, observing the shape of the ocean surface uh, above them, the precise location of faults and their long-term motions and displacements associated with earthquakes, changes in the ice caps of Greenland and Antarctica, the energy content of forests subject to wildfires, and the locations and extent of archaeological ruins in remote areas that are hidden by dense forest. And these are some of the things that our faculty in that particular program area have been involved in. Uh, and so the PhD degree actually is a natural progression 
to a research degree that uh, provides uh, the college the opportunity to both recruit faculty and students uh, in uh, this area to conduct research and to develop solutions to many of the problems that we face uh, on this earth. And this, this particular degree will, um, again, be very useful for applications in business, in science, in service, in the service industries, as well as homeland security uh, and national defense. And there is an expectation uh, that this area will continue increasing in terms of its contributions to science, and therefore a PhD program will position the department, it will position the University of Houston to have a large footprint in this area. We um, expect the program to have a total of 15, uh, I'm sorry, 18 doctoral students by its fifth year. Uh, again, this is a research degree, and we believe that it will be very, very um, helpful in recruiting high-quality faculty who are conducting research in this area who secure NSF grants uh, to join the department and help elevate and increase the status of the University of Houston in the geosensing uh, area nationally and internationally. We expect the program to be revenue generating within its first three years and uh, be a self-sustaining program going forward. Uh, we recommend approval of this degree. Uh, it's a uh, been through the review process, as all others, and we believe it's worthy <coughs> of your consideration. Would you like for me to present the other one or answer questions uh, regarding this one? Uh, I, I would say, since they're both uh, connected with engineering, why don't you present the other one, and then if somebody from the okay. engineering is here, we can we ask We do. Them. We have two, two faculty uh, who are here from each of these, one from each area who will be um, available to answer questions from the, the committee. The second degree is a Doctor of Philosophy in Petroleum Engineering. As you are aware, Petroleum Engineering is one of our uh, most um, uh, uh, growing areas in the College of Engineering. We um, want to establish a world-class faculty. We have a world-class faculty. We want to keep growing it. And one of the things we know uh, is that Without a PhD program, it will be very difficult to recruit top-notch uh, academy member, quality type faculty to come to the University of Houston. With this being such a popular area, one in which uh, the University of Houston has a big footprint in petroleum engineering, it is only natural that we would add a PhD program to the already existing BS, MS, and MPE program that already exist in the department. Um, the current demand for doctoral graduates um, is being met in the industry by hiring non-petroleum engineering students who are then trained uh, in upstream energy area. So the, the department believes that by providing a PhD in petroleum engineering uh, that we'll be able to better prepare people to enter industry, to enter the field, but also enter into a research um, um, sector to be able to contribute um, more substantially to this entire growth area in petroleum engineering, petroleum engineering that we're experiencing. We expect this program to be um, uh, overall a revenue generating program. It will substantially add to the undergraduate programs and master's programs that already exist. Uh, and the petroleum engineering program, I might add, at U of H has been experiencing tremendous growth. The undergraduate enrollment uh, has been growing exponentially. It's now at nearly 600 students, and the MS program is, is at around 100 students, um, which is double the enrollment that was here in the program in 2008. So we recommend approval of this program also. Um, I would invite the representatives from the geosensing uh, program area and also petroleum engineering, uh, Mike Carroll, to come forward and uh, answer questions that you might have about these two uh, PhD programs. Uh, I have a question regarding geosensing. I see where that's a joint 
uh, I guess, project with is it UCLA? Correct. Yeah, where where the, where are the actual is it field studies or where where the actual uh, where where is the, the research conducted? Is it uh, in a lab or is it out in the Gulf no, of Mexico? Field, uh, in the in the field. Uh, just to give an idea, uh, last four years we've been here. We've had uh, over 170 plus projects submitted. Out of that, 46%—I uh, don't know the number—was, you know, uh, funded. Uh, that includes all over the country, in the United States, and overseas like uh, Mexico, Belize, New Zealand, Antarctica. Uh, what we have is the uh, technology that collects the accurate geosensing data. Anything you want to know, the position accurate in the, anywhere in the surface of the Earth, we are yet. We go anywhere in the world to map it. And one of the, one of the recent things that happened uh, three, about a year ago, we mapped the, uh, this uh, archaeological site in Honduras, never seen before, never touched before. It has gotten a lot of budge. Uh, and uh, so it is uh, in a field activity. We have a different kinds of whole host of urban sensors. That's how we started. Uh, but we are from space to the, uh, you know, high altitude, fixed string UAV plus the Eurobond and the drone coming up drone in the next decade, and the, uh, uh, you know, small UAVs also. Plus, we also re do research on the, on the ocean. So we are all from space to the surface of the Earth. So if, if in this program uh, research we develop a Technology is that technology jointly? Uh, is that something we in UCLA would share? In the, in well, the, in technology the, we are responsible for developing technology. Uh, UCLA uh, portion is the science component because they are very good at science what they do, which is the art and planetary science. And we are engineers; we build things. So it's a combination, you know, of the engineering and science. That's what it is. And I think, you know, the one thing that I would like to very briefly is that it's a truly a multidisciplinary uh, program in the uh, 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 which includes the two colleges and the four departments, uh, civil and environmental engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and earth and atmospheric sciences. So it is a combination, a synergy of both uh, engineering and science. I say we are targeting the global market because there was a study done about, you know, about a decade ago by the Department of Labor, uh, which started exceeding the expectation. This industry, which is called the geospatial industries, is supposed to generate $30 billion annually every year. So hundreds of billions of dollars, which we are surpassing that. So we are trying to do that. And it is the program uh, of its kinds, unlike anywhere in the world. So we want to make it, and it already is, the destination of choice for the grad students in the geosensing. So, you're, so the, you're saying our current program is recognized as one of the best in the in the country these days? I would say I would argue this is the best because yeah. nobody else has it. Very good. Any other questions for uh, regarding geosensing? Yes, I did have uh, one question. These these new programs will be available this this fall, fall of 2014. No, uh, we are going to have a. No. We, we, have, we will have to submit these to the coordinating board okay. for their review and approval, and that will take longer uh, than this fall to get that approval. And so for all these programs, these new programs, we anticipate probably the fall of 2015? Well, certainly for the PhD programs, would ha which have to go through a review and approval by the coordinating board. The others have a 30-day posting notice uh, for the master's degrees, and once that's cleared, then they can begin. We will post those immediately upon your approval tomorrow of all of these degree programs. So the master's we've already approved masters, will likely be available fall 2014? It should be. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And the undergrad, yes, the okay. master's should be. Okay. Um, where are we in the recruiting? I see we still need to recruit a couple of new faculty members. Are, mm -hmm. are we, have we started that process and have we got yes, some uh, strong candidates of, in yes, under con consideration? That. Part of that, we already have six faculty hired. Out of that, of five tenure track faculty, I'm the first one to come here in 2010. One research faculty and four other uh, faculty, which includes two in civil and engineering, one in electrical engineering, and one in uh, earth and atmospheric science. 
And one we are sending, actually, we are in the works to send off a letter in the mechanical engineering right now, as we speak. So we are hoping to uh, hire the last one, the eighth one, within the next six to nine months, six to months a year. We've been aggressively hiring the College of Engineering okay. to meet the man. And I would think that the broader use of some of, the t some of this type technology would um, create grant opportunities. Do, is this an area where we've uh, sought grants for our research and, uh, and what do we anticipate uh, the benefit to that with respect to the cost of the program? Well, cost of the program, I can tell you, <clears throat> as I said, I came here back in 2010, January, so I've been there just about four years. I can tell you the, uh, what happened in the last four years until the end of 2013. Our at that time, we still have, we have only six faculties so far out of eight. Out of that, we have approximately generated $10 million in-hand grants, funded grants. Those are all federal funds, which is important, you know. What's uh, the agency that we typically get? Uh, we have mostly NSF National Science Foundation. Okay. Uh, there are lots of federal agencies, USDA, you know, Department of Defense. Uh, there's a whole host of, you know, other agencies. And uh, if you look at that, um, beyond 2005th uh, year, uh, we have generated in-hand grants, uh, let's see, approximately $15 million. Uh, so that's six faculty, by the way. We still have two more faculty to come. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, I would say the, uh, the path forward is uh, bright. Good. Thank you. Any other questions um, for him? We have questions about petroleum engineering. We have Mike Harold here. Uh, with regard to petroleum, doctors in petroleum engineering, I would say it's uh, probably long overdue uh, being situated here in Houston, Texas. Uh, and it's really great that we are uh, provide, you know, offering this, uh, uh, this program because of just your your base of petroleum engineers here based in Houston. I would think that's a great opportunity to uh, uh, to grow it. Where, where do you anticipate getting uh, your candidates, your students from in, your grad, in the doctor's program? PhDs in petroleum will come from, well, petroleum undergrad and chemical and mechanical engineering. Petroleum engineering is a multidisciplinary engineering program. A lot of the big energy companies hire non-petroleum engineers and then train them into the petroleum engineering field to fill the void until uh, bona fide petroleum engineers are trained. Uh, the fact is uh, with four faculty currently and six uh, by the fall uh, and then 600 undergrads, it's non-sustainable uh, to bring the faculty up to a level that uh, is consistent with those numbers. Uh, we won't be able to hire the top faculty without a Ph.D. program. Uh, well, one that we have recruited from Texas A&M, the small school about 90 miles from here, uh, is in the National Academy of Engineering. She'll be joining us in the uh, fall. Christina Conmedes. And that's great. I have a uh, partner f from that school, and I'll remind him. I'll, I'll mention that, uh, that to him when I see him later today. Okay. Any, uh, any questions regarding that? No question, just a comment. Uh, you know, I've been in the petroleum business for 35 years, and uh, it's certainly nice to hear from my Aggie buddies what a great job we're doing of educating petroleum engineers, what a great petroleum engineering department we have here at the University of Houston. Very gratifying. Thank you. And I just add, Mr. Chairman, uh, some to the Bauer discussion, I congratulate Chancellor, Dr. Shore, and the Dean of the School of Engineering, much like Bauer, for these fantastic new programs. I'm sure they're going to be in high demand. It's going to help us recruit top-notch faculty. We're going to continue to improve the prestige of the university, and uh, these are all fantastic programs. I'm really excited about them. Right. Any other uh, questions? If, if not, I might hear a motion to approve the two doctorate, uh, Doctor of Philosophy degree programs presented uh, as presented, please. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, these two items are hereby approved. Uh, this concludes the presentations and approval of our 12 action items today. Uh, may I have a motion to place all 12 of these action items on the board's
set a docket agenda for final board approval. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, these 12 items unanimously approved by the committee will be placed on the board's consent docket agenda for final board approval at the May 7, 2014 Board of Regents uh, meeting. Uh, we're going to have a uh, uh, video presentation in just a minute. I want to take a uh, divert back real quick uh, if we can. Uh, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, someone in our audience, uh, Mr. Asit Shaw, our new student region who was recently appointed by Governor Rick Perry. Asit, if you'll uh, step up real quick, we'd like to... So his appointment uh, becomes effective on June 1st. Uh, uh, so we really look forward to uh, uh, carrying on the legacy of our great, uh, we've had a great run of student regents and uh, hear good things about you. And uh, we'd like to welcome you uh, uh, to our meeting. If you want to just take a second and tell us what you're studying here at UH. And Hi, my name is Asit. Um, I'm an undergrad in the Bauer College of Business and the Honors College. I'm studying, um, I'm actually in the Global Energy Management Program. I was excited to hear that I got approved today. Um, and I think I'm the youngest region so far, so that was pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Setting a new standard, huh? That's great. Well, welcome to our meeting, and thank you uh, for serving the university. I would also, uh, Chancellor, if, I, if, if uh, I believe our interim president for uh, UHV is here, right. uh, um, Mr. Moore, if you take, if you would take a second yes. and introduce him to us. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have uh, President Morgan here, um, and uh, he has been kind enough to uh, accept and come here and help us out. UH Victoria is a, is a great campus, and we just need. Uh, you know, to the, the leadership here, and he has uh, vast experience within Texas of being president for many, many years here. So we welcome Dr. Morgan, and if it's okay, if you have a couple of minutes, I'd like to invite Dr. Morgan to the microphone, and he can tell you a little bit more about himself. Thank you, Chancellor and Regents. I'm pleased to be with you for this, my first Regents meeting uh, with the University of Houston system. I, uh, I do come from Alpine, Texas, uh, where I've been for about the last 38 years, uh, serving as a professor of mathematics, uh, a variety of administrative posts, and the president of the university for about 20 years. So uh, I am honored to uh, have been given the opportunity to serve the University of Houston, Victoria. Looking very much forward to working with you and with the faculty and staff and citizens in uh, Victoria as we move forward with our plans to be a destination university. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Great. Thank you for, uh, for coming here today. We appreciate your, your service. Thank you. The uh, last item on the agenda today is item N, uh, is a presentation uh, of video, U, uh, the video UHN4, uh, University of Houston. Dr. Short, will you please present this item? Yes, um, I've already decided there are some possible Academy Award nominees in this video, uh, so um, be sure and look out for them. Uh, I just wanted to note uh, in your materials you should have a, a little card that uh, is one of our very first uh, efforts at promoting UHN4. Uh, there, was, there are going to be uh, many more materials that are being developed by our communications uh, unit uh, so that we can begin spreading the word across the, the region and the state that there's a new uh, program at uh, the University of Houston that our students should take advantage of. Um, so today, uh, you've heard me talk about UHN4 in the past, uh, and we wanted to share with you the video that will be on the website as well as used as we uh, conduct orientation for our students uh, and as we meet with our uh, requisite uh, stakeholder groups uh, out in the community to promote this program. So uh, enjoy.
My students come to the University of Houston. We want them to have an exit plan. By exit plan, I mean that they have a plan to graduate on time in four years. We have a new initiative at the University of Houston to help students to be able to accomplish that. UH in four is our new program to save students time, save them money, and help them enter their careers or their graduate study faster. UH4 to me is like a master plan for time management. It gives you an overview in four years, I'm going to accomplish this, I'm going to do it in these steps. I know when I've met the table when I have and I can adjust. It's, it's the master plan to make it through college in the best way possible in four years. It was really important for me to graduate in four years because I wanted to use everything that I was learning here at the university as soon as possible. I wanted to make sure that everything that I was putting into my professional toolbox, so everything that I was gaining from my academic advisors, my professors, and even my career counselor, was actually put to good use out there in the real world. Well, I think UH in four is important for a number of reasons. First of all, most parents, and I have two kids in college myself, uh, want some assurance that uh, they can help in any way where their kids can graduate in four years. Secondly, most parents would love to have or know what their budget needs to be for four years of college. At the University of Houston, student success is a no excuse priority, and it's a collaborative approach. UH and four is a partnership with students that provides a comprehensive plan for on-time graduation in four years. A cornerstone of UH and four is a four-year graduation agreement that lays out responsibilities for students and for the university in achieving four-year graduation. The other thing that we've attached to our UH in four is a four-year fixed tuition plan. And that means that when you start at the University of Houston, your tuition will remain the same the entire four years that you're in school earning your degree. Another great thing that I like about it is that it simplifies your degree plan. It's one sheet that tells you all the courses that you need from your day one here on campus to till graduation. And I know that it, you know navigating all the different courses can be challenging sometimes, but UH and four definitely simplify the process for you and your family. The UH and four program is a wonderful opportunity for students to maximize their potential, to utilize all the resources that we have here at University of Houston to support them in that effort, and by graduating in four to take advantage of the unique opportunities that are out there in the Houston market, the global market, really. Imagine how quickly, if you graduate in four years, you can join the 1,600 University of Houston graduates who list themselves as a CEO, or owner, or principal of a company. Moving from high school to college is a huge step. I hope that when you start college, you're looking forward to the experience, and we hope that it's some of the best four years of your life. Because my dream is always that when the students graduate from here, they're graduating as leaders in this global economy set with the tools and the capabilities and the skill set that they will need to lead. And I want my students to lead the world. Go learn. Go succeed. Go make a difference. Go cool. That's very good. So this is going to be in the admission center online. It's uh, what's the everywhere we can put it. <laughs> <laughs> and please feel free to use it when you're promoting UH and four to your to your uh, colleagues because we look to the board to help uh, in that process. So it, it will be on the website. Uh, the link can always be used um, um, in any venue. That's great. It's very popular. Before we started the orientation, even formal orientation, right now 210 students have signed up anyway and already knowing. And it's a contract. The student will do and agree to do these things, and the university agrees to do these things. And uh, parents like it, the students like it, so I think it's going to be quite popular. And there's a bet going on between Dr. Carlucci and Dr. Short about the number as to, uh, you know, what they'll make. So I'm going to win no matter who wins. So. <laughs> <coughs> That's great. Yeah, I know the chairman now. Every time, I know every time somebody comes over his house, it's going to make him watch it now. <laughs> <laughs> we expect him to win on Academy Award. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Short, for the presentations today. There will not be an executive uh, session held today for this committee. Uh, does anyone have any further questions or comments? Uh, being no further business uh, to come before this committee, uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.